uh, today. Who will be talking about biometrics and security, I guess, which is his main area of research. Uh, Marius received his PhD here at Carnegie Mellon uh, with Professor Kumar, who's here in attendance. Um, and uh, since he graduated, he focused on the interesting areas of biometrics, uh, which is, of course, a major component of what we call cyber physical system security. Uh, so Marius will give an overview of the research topics uh, that his laboratory covers here at, uh, at Scilab. And uh, if you uh, want any technical details about any of these topics, uh, you are more than welcome to contact Marius directly. So Marius, it's all yours. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. So uh, with that, I will dive into my talk. And uh, as uh, Professor Google mentioned, uh, please ping me for any of the technical details. This is sort of a, a snapshot glimpse of everything we're doing and uh, just to sort of whet your appetite. And same thing goes to all the uh, industry partners that are watching this remotely. Uh, first thing I'm going to show is um, something we're doing on the more of the sort of secure computing side. How do we uh, continuously authenticate the user as he's working on a workstation. So, you know, traditionally you've got passwords and you can think of biometrics in terms of fingerprint or iris, but typically that's something to actually log you on to the session, right? How do you continuously make sure that the person who is authorized is the person still at the computer and hasn't left the uh, workstation to get a coffee and somebody goes in and tailgates? or somebody calls on a phone and you haven't logged off, you know, how do you make sure that whoever's on the workstation is the authorized person? And more importantly, how do you do that without hogging all the computer resources? So we've come up with a smart way of actually doing a, a hard authentication at the beginning, in this case fingerprint or iris, and then we're using a simple phase algorithm that's computationally efficient to just check if that person's still there. So it actually will learn however way your face looks at that point and just check if you come back. So that's what you're seeing here. And this is the work of a couple of my students down here. And one of them is here, Aaron. So he actually made this whole system. So this is one of my other students, Daphne. She's actually logging on. Um, so you're using Iris first. It authenticates. So now it actually learns what she looks like at that point in time. Grabs a several sequence of video frames. And, and what he's actually doing is something simple, an individual PCA or correlation filters. We have different algorithms, and we measure the performance. Um, now she left for the workstation. And Khaled is going to scrupulously try to go in to do something. And of course, the system recognizes that's not, that's not Daphne and locks the system. Now, Daphne returns, of course, without seeing Khaled. And since it's, 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 it's within a time frame, it allows FACE to re-authenticate her. If she was gone for a longer period of time, then it would have actually asked for to re-authenticate using Iris. So, and of course, all those parameters are, are soft tunable. You can change the time out periods. You can change the initial hard authentication, whether it's fingerprint on your, on your mouse or, or keyboard, and, and so forth. And what we're working towards is actually integrating the face part onto the GPU. So using the graphics card to do all the processing so that we're completely not utilizing any of the CPU cores at all. Right now, it's using one of the cores, and of course, with today's computing, almost all computers are at least you know dual core or quad core, and so you can easily you know dedicate one core to be doing these kind of things. But if you think about secure systems, most secure facilities, secure places, are not using graphics card that much. They're using the CPU. Uh, with that, so we can easily use that to actually do all the biometric continuous authentication. So here's the big picture. Th that's sort of our secure computing side of things. Now we're going to sort of the remote, uh, long-range uh, biometric identification and the different components. So this is sort of a snapshot of everything. And so, you know, of course, first we have to detect the face. Uh, for that, we're using something public, the Viola Jones uh, detector from OpenCV. Uh, we've actually retrained. We have a better version of it. But the, the core algorithm is something that's out there. Uh, we've done some face tracking, I'll talk about that. But more importantly, I'll talk about our facial landmarking work, you know, sort of the stepping stone. Before you can do anything, we need to be able to robustly landmark the face to be able to align, to register the images. 
uh, and I'll talk about some of that work, how we actually do that. And that allows us to do a lot of things, facial expression, facial analysis, shape analysis, uh, generating a 3D model from a 2D, and that's something uh, one of my students, uh, Jingu, did for his thesis, and continuing on more work. Um, and it leading to really unconstrained facial recognition from you know, uh, surveillance footage, and that's what we're going towards. Um, we've also done some preliminary work in periocular, not much, uh, but more importantly, some of the long-range iris. So as you have face and iris, you'll see that current systems and current integrators have sort of decoupled. There's a lot of uh, system integrators that just do iris, and a lot of people just do face, and yet none of them is doing both, and it's ridiculous because to get the face, to get the iris, you need the face. So you've got both in most cases anyway, and you're not just using that. So we're, we're, we're actually taking a holistic approach and using both. Okay, so with the first step, uh, looking at the face detection and tracking, and the scenario that you think about is, for example, you have a pan tail zoom camera, you're monitoring outdoors in you know, a parking lot or some secure site, and you're tracking the person as they're coming in the door. Uh, this is some of the work my student Utsav did on common filter tracking where uh, as you have a motorized system tracking, you know, you've got to account for occlusion, somebody walking behind trees, uh, people walking in front of you, how do you make sure you're still tracking the person? And here we're not doing any identification, so we're not saying this is still the same face. We're not even doing matching of the face. So what I'll show you is some work we did for Sandia about uh, a year ago, uh, where we had developed the algorithm completely on our side, and we threw it across their fence, and uh, this is a video, literally, in a, inside a van 50 meters from a uh, uh, parking lot at a uh, uh, shopping center. So it's locked under Kevin, and in a moment you'll see him moving. Now this whole uh, pan tilt system inside, 50 meters away. So he's moving, look at all that occlusion. So it's gonna lose him in a second. But that's still pretty amazing given that, you know, we've actually just developed the algorithm here, threw it across the fence, and it worked at, at first. That it, uh... Okay, with that, we go into the second part, which is robust landmarking. And this is sort of the, the most important thing that you do in any kind of face recognition system. How do you align two faces together? How do you make sure you're comparing apples to apples in terms of facial features? So with that, we actually have one of the densest landmarking systems out there. We actually manually, uh, can automatically label 79 points on the face. Uh, we're using an active shape model, uh, and we've actually generated a new algorithm, which is different from what Kutz had originally proposed back in the day. We have published this in actually in B-Test, and I have a citation at the end, uh, could have modified active shape models. So, of course, offline you have a model which you have to actually label a whole bunch of faces to train it. So we've come up with this scheme, and the reason 79 points sort of worked is because we could come up with a scheme to actually tell somebody who's labeling these are the points. So with respect to the chin, you go up, up and you find the sort of left corner of the eye, right corner of the eye. These are points that we could actually train somebody to find uniquely. You can do more dance, but it's, there's a limit to how much you can then train the operator. At some point you start doing interpolating. We start saying, okay, there's five points between these two points, making new points. So these are sort of the 79 points that you can manually label and identify. So there is a face detection. Of course, we have to detect the face, and then we actually leash our shape model to try to fit on the face. Um, one question that I expect to come up is, you know, well, how, how sensitive is this to shift or, or uh, translation or scale? Because face detectors, especially the open source ones are not that good. We have a journal right now going out showing that we're actually robust to about 50, set, 50 pixels, plus or minus 50 pixels in X and Y, and 30% scale. So as long as we're somewhere in that range, our algorithm will actually be able to uh, essentially find the face correctly through more iterations and still get the same shape. So it's not that sensitive compared to the traditional active shape and active appearance models out there. Uh, now another main thing is of course, you know, we all know as we do different research, you know, you train on one data set 
and sometimes you partition the data set into two, and you train on half the images and test another half, and sometimes the same person is the same. And of course, in that case, that's a simple scenario, right? If you've seen the person, even if it's different days or different, year, you know, different years, it's still the same subject, right? It will work. The challenge here is how do you actually train on one particular data and then test so that it works on unseen people, unseen scenarios, completely different from the sensors you've acquired. And that's what we've done. We've actually trained on 500 images from the multi-biometric grand challenge database from NIST. And then we're testing it on basically phase in the wild, you know, Flickr database, images Googled off the web. And here's an example of, of facial feedings on images that are basically never seen before. And as you can see, it's doing a pretty decent job. Still has some work to do on the jawline. Jawline is something that's still even ill-defined for the human operator. So as you're moving your face left and right, you can see that sometimes it's not clear where the jawline is, right? Uh, but then, you know, depending on your application, the jawline itself may not be so much, up, uh, maybe useful. So what we're working right now is actually trying to make this work for off angle significantly. We can handle right now plus or minus 15 degrees or so. Here is a video of it working in action. Uh, this is not real time. This was not real time at that time. So what you're seeing is basically each frame uh, basically processed individually and then put back together. Th that particular processing took about two seconds per image. Uh, not that fast. However, we've just, uh, one of my other students, Nick, has basically codified it and we have it operating at about 12 frames per second. So going from two seconds per image to 12 frames per second in real time. This is not that, but the algorithm same would actually generate the same images. The other thing to note in this image, is, in this video, is that there is no temporal tracking whatsoever. We're showing each frame individually landmarked. So some other work we've done that I haven't integrated in this slideshow yet is that we're actually doing some tracking of the facial features. So if you know that if you can actually model the tracking temporarily, you get better estimates and you don't have this jitters as one point doesn't fit so well. So that's something we've done and actually presented at the, um, that was the uh, ECCV workshop in, uh, in Crete, which no one got to go at the time, but anyway, different story. Okay, so with the facial landmarking, uh, it actually allows us to look at some of the shape, shape recognition analysis. And this is something we also did for some work for the FBI in integrating to the Universal Face Workstation. So as they're forensically analyzing and matching faces, we've come up, we've actually integrated this module as part of their workstation. And with that, we actually did some work in doing shape analysis and recognition. So the question is, how much is shape important? And we've shown uh, in, a, in a paper in the winter, actually, application of computer vision, we've actually shown that we can actually fuse shape and texture independently and, and get a boost in performance. So I'll show you some attributes here which are really non-unique and you'll be surprised that there is a difference. But what we're going for is not to help sort of all the people. What we're trying to identify is, is there something unique about you as a face? If we see an input face, can we identify something that we can say, oh, here's something different. Well, then that difference is something we should look out for. So, for example, uh, here's a, a bunch of different facial shapes that are different from the global mean. So what we looked at, we did basically did clustering and try to identify clusters that were different from the mean average shape. And with that, so we can identify, oh, well, you're different. OK, you are sort of group A of faces. And of course, this is sort of the highest, coarsest uh, resolution. We want to go to actually go to individual facial features, shape of the eyes, nose, mouth. How can we actually use that to say, Oh, you've got a type 1 mouth, you've got a type 2 nose, a type 3 eye shape. These are all kind of the uh, attributes that law enforcement to some extent uses. We want to replicate some of that. So here's something you know, completely sort of the simplest feature possible, sort of the width of the face. Now this, this width of the face is based on normalized uh, faces on the interocular distance. So we've, we've resized the face to be, you know, whatever, 80 pixels between the eyes. So it's not, uh, you know, because width, of course, will be meaningless otherwise, right? It will be a function of how far you're away from the camera. So even simple thing, which you would never even think of being any way discriminative, 
what you're saying is there are there are significant more amount of people than you would ordinarily think of that are up above you know from the mean. So there are some folks that are you know do have a distinctive width of the face. So what that means is when you're doing a match and you're doing a match in a in a in a, in a probe image, if you do see okay this person has a width of the face that is actually outside the normal. You know, oh, is this really distinctive? It's really, really large. Well, that helps you narrow down your search data set when you're doing it in, in your target gallery. So that's how we, 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 we actually try to integrate some of these features. Even length of chin, okay? You can still see that there is some people that do have something completely different from the average length of the chin. So if you're average, if you're an average Joe, it's, it's not gonna help you much. But if you're not, that's where we use this. Okay, so here's something I'll talk about that's sort of our uh, pride and joy of what we've done. And uh, we, we call it GEM because it's generic elastic models. So basically the idea here is how do we generate a 3D model of your face from a single 2D image? We know very well that if you have multiple images, multiple observations, and as long as you can actually do point correspondences along these frames, you can actually reconstruct 3D information, right? You can use algorithms like structure for motion and, and variations to reconstruct a sparse set of points or dense set if you can actually do good correspondence. Well, what if you only have a single image? What can you do then? So there's been a lot of work from um, in, in Europe by uh, Blanz and Vetter on uh, making 3D morphable models. Um, those approaches take a lot of computing power and non-real time and require manual marking of certain features on the face. Our algorithm and our implementation actually is completely automated and is under a second to build a model. So, and of course, these are uh, images generated from the uh, frontal face of uh, uh, the French newscast. So the way it works is we have an input image, we run our facial landmarking. Based on that, we deform, we elastically deform a model that we built offline. And we'll actually show you not only the, the texture of different poses, but actually show you our 3D shapes to show you that we're not just plastering the texture onto a canonical 3D model and it looks good. It's, it, we're actually estimating and getting a 3D depth map that is different for every person and the shape changes and we'll show that. And we're actually building <coughs> ethnic group models. So we have an Asian, non-Asian model, we have a model for female or male and all combinations and we're trying to expand that. And we'll be running a data collection actually and hopefully starting in the next two weeks and we of course invite all of you, anyone interested to come by and uh, be part of our a study and of course you'll get a complete 3D craniofacial scan of your face from an actual 3D scanner. So we'll, we'll have that ready for you and besides the monetary gift that will be given out. So here's some examples of uh, the results we're getting. So this is the input images. So here we are using a specific ethnic model. So we've built that and we've, uh, we've actually generated the, the models have been generated from only 100 images. Uh, from a public databases. So right now, this is sort of the worst model modeling we can actually do, particularly since some of our ethnic models only have maybe six images to generate that model. So as we do our data capture and get more data, we will have statistically better uh, generalization. So what I want you to look at basically are, are these two rows here, the three texture row and the shape. And if you look at sort of the nose, the mouth, the facial features, you'll see that they do change the 3D shape here actually is morphed to model the 2D appearance that it's seeing at the bottom. Obviously, we don't handle glasses yet, so those are not there, but the, the texture part of the glasses does appear on the face. So it, it looks okay when you look at it frontally, but as the glasses, you rotate the face to the right, the glasses have seemed to have been a permanently pressed part of your face, which is normal right now, right? But even that, it, it still works. Um, so, female Caucasian, another model, you can see again, uh, the different noses are different for every person. And sort of, uh, there, there's two 
folks I, I always pick on, and there's my sort of favorite uh, TV actor show uh, appearance on TV, and that's Jay Leno and uh, Oprah. So if, if you look at Jay Leno, for example, you can see that the nose art structure is actually sort of further up in the, in the shape. The, the chin is morphed accordingly, same thing with the mouth. Uh, and if you look at Oprah, the same thing happens there too. So you can clearly see that there are 3D model model actually does deform to uh, represent the 2D appearance that it that has actually seen. Now, the goal of this is not to do post-correction. The goal of this is actually to do post-synthesis. So deviating from the traditional thinking of, of, of face recognition, we do not want to just derotate off angle to frontal. And in fact, we cannot do so because if you look at me this way, you have no idea what my left part of my face looks like, right? If, if I do somehow derotate that frontally, then I've assumed symmetry somehow and have warped some part of my right part of my face and my left part. That is unacceptable. From a for facial forensics point of view, I have made up data, uh, I have, or I have altered the data. What we do is we take a pristine enrollment from the frontal. From the frontal, we can move that to that particular angle and do the matching at, the, at that particular angle. That is different, and that is more acceptable, at least from a law enforcement side, or a facial forensic analysis point of view. Of course, uh, we do not discriminate. So if you are someone from Avatar, we will not leave you behind. We shall also take care of you and accommodate. Uh, and if you know any, any other lands, please forward them to us. We shall also accommodate them in our uh, presentation. We are working to handle smiles. So right now, we're not taking care of facial expressions. Uh, where in our database collection, we will be acquiring different facial expressions so that we can actually build a physical model of the face and physically open and close the mouth. So model the muscle structure, model the bone structure as it changes as you do facial expressions. So that's something that we, we, we will be doing. Here's some examples of actually rotating those faces at different off-angle images, poses. So again, what you're seeing at the top is the, basically the, f the front, uh, frontal face image downloaded from the web. That was input to our algorithm, and here's the different faces at different angles. So you can see it's actually pretty good. Uh, there are some issues with the nose, as you would have, you know, staring at those images after a while, you would have said, hold on, nose is slightly, looks weird. And one of the reasons for that is our generic database for training sort of our offline 3D model is of only such a small number of samples, we're not getting a really representative estimate of the nose. Uh, so as that changes, we will be able to get a better model of the nose. Of course, uh, since we're estimating 3D from a single 2D image, there's also a limit to how much you can represent the nose, right? You can't truly estimate the nose depth. By the way, Marius, there is a lot of work on the nose. You should talk to plastic surgeons. Yes, we are actually in talks to some of the work from, uh, yes, that's a very good point. <laughs> uh, in fact, celebrities in general is, uh, is an interesting thing because they constantly go through a lot of changes. Nose, cheeks, uh, the works. So uh, we, it, as we uh, collect more data on them, we would like to actually do a chronological analysis of how they change. And, of course, there's a lot of work, you know. The nice thing is this where paparazzi actually helps us. We know when they go to what operation, and we have images from movies and to see. So that's actually something that Hollywood is helping us. Um, but that's actually a very important <coughs> point. People do change. Um, now, going to some applications of, of sort of security interest, you know, if you had a very low res image of Osama, what can you do to reconstruct that face? So here's, okay, there's always something. Murphy's Law is always going to kick in. All right, I'll get that video at the end. Don't know why it's not playing. It was playing 20 minutes ago. Okay. Here's the images of Angelina anyway. Uh, now, one thing you'll notice is the, it's modeling the same illumination shadow, right? So that's still there. Well, the advantage of being in 3D is that we can now actually 
place a point source anywhere and either take off that shadow by adding another illumination to cancel it or reintroduce shadows at a particular angle. So some students are looking at spherical harmonics to try to modeling the illumination of shadows to do that. So it's a different approach from just taking the, the traditional signal processing approach to modeling shadows and removing them by sort of say, high pass filtering. Now we can actually take a computer graphics approach to take care of that. So how does this lead us to do unconstrained phase recognition? Um, Let me pause and show you what we've done here. So this is a snippet from uh, Groundhog Day, and uh, it sort of uh, co-aligns with our, with our uh, timing. Uh, Groundhog Day was a couple of days ago, or last week, so not too far off. Uh, although Bill Murray was not here at the time, unfortunately, that would have been great. Uh, we, we took a frontal image from uh, the sequence, and we built a 3D model of him. What you're seeing there is basically the 3D model of the face that we generated from Bill Murray's frontal image. And what it's doing is it's the best estimate, post-estimated face, and we're doing computing basically the, the simplest matching. We're, we're basically computing the normalized correlation between our 3D model face at that particular angle matching that face. So that's what you're seeing here, the top score. And again, we've, we've, there's a whole bunch of more complicated matches we can build, right? We can build subspace matches. Uh, do significantly more complex things. We've done the simplest thing to show the efficiency, to show basically the robustness of our 3D modeling approach. Now what you're seeing here is basically that matching a traditional sort of frontal face with some small variation. So as, you, as I have this thing running, what you will see is that as they're both frontal, both scores give sort of the same high score value, right? But as the post changes, traditional approach goes really goes down. More importantly, with our method, again, using the, the, the dumbest matcher possible, you're getting a score that's almost uniform, regardless of what pose. And that's what you want, really, because at the end of the day, you're going to set a threshold, and you're going to say, anything above this threshold, I can verify that this is indeed Bill Murray, right? Otherwise, you will not be able to authenticate or identify Bill Murray robustly in an open set problem, right? If it's a closed set, identification problem is very simple to be able to figure out who it is. This to me was the most exciting thing, by the way, right? To be able to show this. And we have more. So the next thing we did and we got excited, we said, okay, let's take the CMU Pi data set, which was collected robotics, and um, there's uh, about 240 people in here. Uh, in this data set, we only used a, a subset of that. But we, we showed basically the, the, the approach here. And what we've, did, what we've done is basically aligned the faces based on the, on the eye coordinates and did the matching. So we took the frontal image of the person during a 3D model, and now we're matching against the other four poses of the person. So here's a test image at about you know, uh, 30 degrees or so. And we want to go cycle through the data set to find where it matches. Now we're doing the whole CSI. We obviously do not need to rotate the whole amount of degrees, right? We're just doing that for purely illustration purposes. But at the end, you'll see it'll match, that's what it matched best. So even though there's a different in spatial expression, it still found the right person. Again, when we do pose estimation, we can estimate the pose of the person and we have integrated that, then you only need to, you only need to do a small delta plus or minus in your pitch roll. But I thought this was really cool to actually be able to show that you know, we're handling pose in a non-subspace approach, but by actually on the fly generating and going through the gallery. So all we need here was just a single image of that person frontal, which is your typical enrollment scenario anyway, right? The problem is how do you get off angle of that person? You don't usually. So we've run some statistics and uh, Going through the whole experiment, you can see that traditional approach, you know, really fails at 30 degrees. You know, 15 degrees is able to do something 70 percent. With a 3D approach, we're basically, you know, getting about 97 percent across uh, 15 and 30 degrees. So we're collecting a new data set, you know, with a whole complete 3D creating facial. We also have cameras to capture 2D images, so we can do benchmarking as we go to 45 degrees, 60 degrees, and beyond and that we'll be able to show our findings there. So
So as we did that, I said, you know, I called one student one night, and I probably shouldn't say the microphone, but it was a 1 a.m., 2 a.m., had a brainstorm, and of course they're working in the lab too, and I was up in a, somewhere giving a talk, and that's when the best ideas come up. So I said, you know what, let's try this on an actual episode. Let's get, get an episode of Seinfeld, since that's what my students really love. Uh, at least students have loved that. So this is actually matching them. Again, each frame was, was actually independently matched. There's no temporal tracking. There's no temporal information about you know who was there at one frame. There's no scene change. None of that. Each frame was identified independent of each other. Now, at some point, you will see Jerry and Elaine some confusion. You will see Jerry sometimes call Elaine and vice versa. And if you look at just the facial crop at that low resolution of you know 30 by 30 pixels, their smile and nose does actually sort of resemble each other, and that's what's going on with the compression artifacts in such low resolution. It does confuse. Now again, we're using the simplest, dumbest masher possible, right? Normal S correlation. You know, X transpose Y, assuming, uh, of course, you know, making the X and Y unit norm. So, we've also made a real-time demo. Uh, our latest one includes pose estimation, so we're not doing the whole thing. So right now, I'm basically giving an off-angle face, and it's going through all the images in the database of, of the people, of people in my lab. So that's Ramsey, and it's basically looking through everyone and trying to match who I am. So that's actually a real-time capture. The new code is actually more improved. We're using, so you, you, so you actually found, found the right person, found me. Uh, we've actually just demonstrated that working from a CMU ID card. Well, one of my students uh, who's about to graduate this May is a bachelor. We had his ID when he came here four years ago. We scanned that in and rolled that in, and actually was matching, even though you know he had a completely different uh, eyeglass frame. So that was very, very new as of like literally 36 hours ago, and uh, we're trying to get those images in here. As a side effect of this research, something else came of interest, and we said, okay, well, how can we use this for other applications? How would Hollywood make, for example, or you know, privacy? Uh, you know, there, there's many angles to the different research, right? Uh, A can be used for different purposes, and in this case, we thought, you know, how can we use this for privacy? How can we use this to actually de-identify faces? Uh, or if you're in Hollywood and uh, you're an actor and you don't want your squirmish about some of your acts, how can we make sure that your stunt double uh, has your same facial appearance? So what we've done is, uh, basically, we have a whole bunch of input frames. We estimate pose in 3D, and based just a single image of who we want to put in, we basically generate a 3D model and then substitute that into the face, and we generate back the video sequence. So here, uh, we actually put uh, John Cleese's face into Bill Murray's sequence of, of Groundhog Day, and we have another one with, with uh, Jay Leno and Tom Selleck. So, And here we've, we've, we've introduced Sean Connery inside there. Now there, there's some there, there's some wiggly ass because our pose estimator is not that great. We haven't not done any kind of common filter to smooth out, and we've also been doing the alpha blending on every frame. We don't need to be doing that. So this is sort of the version 0.001 pre-alpha release. It can only be two orders of magnitude better from what it is right now. But even then, it's not bad. The one thing you will notice is that we're not modeling expressions, so they're all like going, mmm, 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 you know. But that's okay for now. In, in, in those high jump areas, you actors are not really talking much anyway, they're either screaming or just like, you know. I thought this was actually pretty amazing to me. This sort of this is the uh, Jay Leno, Tom Selleck morph. Yeah, it, it does look like he's sort of talking at the end, right? He's like, uh, again, if you imagine those illuminations or the variations are gone, it, it's actually a pretty good reconstruction. Now, compared to what's actually done in literature, um, there has been some face swapping done. Most of it has been frontal, though, or given a particular pose that was pre-existing. Mm -hmm. To date, there's nothing that's actually covering all the pose variations. So we can actually uh, we can actually handle pose variations sort of face swapping. That is the main contribution here and different to what's out there uh, in literature. 
Uh, some of the other work that uh, my other student doing, someone, uh, we're actually working on sort of really uh, theoretical approach of facial recognition and modeling. You can imagine that as you're doing matching or representing faces, uh, every facial variation, every facial pose, every facial expression is a point in some high dimensional space. Question is, how do you model how somebody looks like in this representation? And so, the, and that's a manifold, right? How do you actually then find a, su a subspace that can basically linearize those variations so you can predict them? So she's using uh, tensors, high order SVDs to basically capture simultaneous variations in pose, illumination, expression, uh, in the future we'll be looking at aging. And, and basically, so here for example, this is PCA and it has pose and you can see everyone sort of all over the place, pose and illumination. And sort of each, each line is a particular person, each color. So illumination is sort of the round, uh, going around the, uh, the, heli the uh, semicircle there. The V structure there is actually the pose. And that's what you're seeing here, right? Um, how do you find a, a sub subspace that actually linearizes that? So you can go, you know, sort of X is pose variation and Y is illumination. And that's what she's working on here, actually, finding the, the embeddings of this, of this manifold. And so you can actually present that. And the idea is you can use that to actually predict what a test image is, you know, what a particular pose or illumination. But also when you're doing matching, now when you're doing matching in the subspace, you know, you're sort of hindered by the traditional Euclidean approaches. You know, here we use geodesic approaches to be able to actually find distance between people and, and not let the variation, uh, such as polar domination, misidentify you. Okay, uh, something else we're looking at is also soft biometrics. So how do we use sort of the traditional things that go into your mind as you look at a, a face? So when you look at someone, you know that you're looking at, you know, male, Caucasian, uh, you know, uh, oh, he looks like uh, uh, he's a particular ethnic group. And there are things that you don't even think about, but you do when you look at a face, right? Most current face matches do not do that. They just take an image A, take an image B, compute some similarity, and that's it. Well, from a law enforcement perspective, people who are trying to evade the systems, you know, they shave, they shave their mustache, they shave their beard, you know, wear different glasses and whatnot. How do you actually use, how do you add intelligence to the systems? And that's what we're working on. And there's something that some of my folks here, Brandon, Diana, uh, and a whole bunch of other folks are working on. The, the goal of, of something that we've done here is that many of the current systems, as somebody stops, a law, a law enforcement officer stops someone at the traffic stop, right, Viol traffic violation. Uh, of course, a uh, person doesn't have any ID, and so he tries to do a check, is this somebody wanted, right? Uh, of course, change facial appearance. What will happen is it will give its top 20 matching uh, lists, per persons in the list. And more, more often, uh, that person will not be in the top 20 because he's changed facial appearance. In fact, you'll be surprised to know that the most famous standard commercial face algorithm, you know, L1, uh, actually does some serious errors. You know, you're looking for a male Caucasian, and five out of your 10 top 20 are female. And you're thinking, why on earth is it bringing me as a top, 20, top 10 match scores? So, I mean, these are things that an operator is, is wasting an operator's cycle trying to remove, where you could have brought some more sort of better candidate pool of, of, of subjects in that top ranked score list. Another motivation is, uh, say you're monitoring, you know, whether airport or, or just anywhere, and you know, it has been a criminal, uh, somebody robbed the bank, right? Uh, you know, police are, or police are called, called to the scene. And you've got, you know, got a, you've got a description of the person, but you don't have an image. So you can say this were all the images captured by the surveillance footage at that point in time. And so you're now saying, okay, I'm looking for male, Caucasian, has facial hair, and has glasses. Well, in this case, it was a nice, simple example, right? 
from all this pool, it boiled down to this was the only person that fit that description. In a real world scenario, it will not be just one person, but it will be a couple of people, right? The important thing is that we've narrowed down the search pool, search list. So we're able to, to bring to to provide sort of intelligence to law enforcement officers and give those images to of people to look for, right? Otherwise they're still looking for those generic descriptions. So here's a demo video that also is not working. Okay, I'll, I'll do that afterwards. Okay, with that we're going to sort of an automated video analysis uh, approach of, of doing face recognition. So in many cases, you do get a video sequence of face, either something <coughs> from a uh, surveillance camera or, or, or cell phone or somewhere, you, you know that there's a face there. You know that the, uh, the, there's a, a number of N people, right, because you can detect so many faces. You know that the, this is the same scene if the subjects don't change or you can model, you can model the background and see if something changes, right? Well, how do you use, how do you, how do you smartly capture that information so that you're not doing face matching for every single pose? And what if you can't match every, what if you can't match every pose? So here's an example. If you ignored the fact that we had all the 3D matching capabilities, and if I tell you that, okay, I'm gonna give you a video sequence of me going from here to here. Well, you know that you can match me at this angle and possibly plus or minus five degrees, right? But you can't match me here and you can't match me here or anything until about here. However, you do know that if you do simple, simple image processing and matching, you can match this frame to this frame and say this is the same person. You can match this frame to this frame and say this is the same person, and so forth, right? So through link analysis, you can, you can actually match and say, you know what, this is the same person from here to here. And so you've got a complete ma match analysis of all those frames and then as long as you can match the frontal frame, now you can put an identity to the subject, okay? So it, it's smartly taking, in, taking into uh, consideration the information, the temporal information. And here's a sequence where we actually applied this to. And that's something Aaron's been working on. So uh, you can see I'm a Stargate fan. Where you don't see a rectangle is because the uh, public uh, face detector did not capture the face. That's all. But even those large pose variations, it still works really well. And this actually stemmed out from uh, my graduate class uh, uh, from pattern recognition. It was one of the projects. These students started there and then took it off and uh, started working it afterwards. Okay. Uh, let me. So, well, periocular, uh, it's something actually me and both Professor Kumar are, are, are working on. Um, how do you match faces when you only have, for, for example, just the region around the eyes, right? If somebody's masked or as you walking through airports or any sort of, you, you don't see a whole face, you only see part of the face, right? And typically that's only the top part. How do you match that? So we're working on different ways to feature extract and match that. Of course, you know, bank surveillance application. Let me just move on forward in the interest of time. Uh, I will show the periocular demo. If it works, boy, okay. All right, I'll, I'll fire that afterwards. Okay. We are also going to working on long range iris recognition. So iris is thought to be robust because it's thought not to change over a person's lifetime or at least be fairly stable. That has still yet to be scientifically proven what range and, and if so and, and what can cause the change. So that's, that's the verdict is still up in the air for that. However, for at this moment, it's thought to work really well and it does, does work so far. I mean, from current studies anyway. Uh, the question, the problem is that you've got different devices and some are more obtrusive than others. So this is the high, this is the peer device or an older version of the high. This is actually what's used in the war theater right now. So a soldier is using one of these and basically invest uh, an insurgent or uh, try to check if uh, a friendly ally is where they say they are. And what happens is, of course, they have to drop all their weapons and use this to basically 
you know, every all this person. And many times that's very hard. And of course puts the soldier in, in jeopardy because he's dropped all his weapons to do this. Um, something you'll see outside my lab is the LG system is slightly better. You only have to be about 15 centimeters away from the system. But still, it's very close, right? And it's bigger. Uh, this is where you get sort of the pristine enrollment. Uh, this is something we got from Sarnoff a couple of years ago, the, Sarnoff, the Irish and the Move system. Uh, and it works about three meter standoff, the original design. We've actually modified, and I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But you can see here there's a difference in the quality. The car and state-of-the-art long-range commercial systems have poor quality acquisition. So while they do work against matching at pristine enrollment, so if I've enrolled through any of these systems, I can be matched here, these are not good enough to actually be used as enrollment images. So we'll talk about the system we're doing now for the DoD, which will capture an, a, a, a pristine enrollment from anywhere from 8 to 13 meters and working beyond. So here's our modified Iris on the move system, this is Ramsey going through, uh, 13 meter. So we have our own algorithm segmentation. Okay, let me see if we can hear that. So it, it demonstrated his name, it actually speaks the name too. Uh, so what we're doing now is how do we capture enrollment quality images, more importantly, how do we capture images that don't require you to go through a choke point? So here there's a camera that has a fixed focal length and basically there's a sweet spot that's going through there that the, the eyes are actually in, in good focus, right? So the question is, how do you make it so that if I'm anywhere from here to say here, because you don't want to, again, you don't want to have to have someone, okay, no, no, please here, no, no, go back here, no, no, go forward, no, no, back, forward, back, and you don't have to dance, right? which you would be if you deployed this kind of system. So we've come up with the optics, and it, you, know, you look at things about depth of field, uh, resolution, spatial resolution, and, and after all that, we come up with a commercial sort of COTS product approach to putting this together, which actually is optimal. Uh, the biggest challenge has been the illumination. So we have an illuminator uh, supplied to us from BIMA. And what we, our, our, our achievement goal is anywhere between 8 and 12 meters. So if you're standing anywhere within that 4 meter capture volume, you will be able to capture an iris of about 200 pixels across the iris. And it will be enrollment quality. So here's the example images. So here's the one from the LG, sort of the pristine enrollment. Here's the one from the IOM. And here's what we can get using our proposed system. And you can see this image is, is more in focus and higher resolution. And the way you can see that is if you look at the, uh, the sort of square light sources here, these are the illumination sources on the eyes and the move. Uh, and they're actually a, a square bank of LEDs. So you can see here they, that square shape is completely gone, right? It's just a circular fuzzball. Here you can not only see the square, you can actually measure the curvature of the cornea based on the deformation of the square bank reflection from the, from the, or the cornea of the, or the iris. So here's a zoom in version, the LG system, peer, the IOM, you can see, wow, okay, you can re identify through that? Yes, we actually can, and the question, but however, you can't use it for enrollment. And here's what we can, we can get. So clearly there's a big difference, right? You can see that. So goal is to be able to have it on APC and be able to scan and match. So with that, I'll, I'll focus on my, on my last thing, and I think we're just about in time also. Um, we're doing general tracking, object tracking, surveillance footage, or anything, except we want to use GPUs. So we're using GPUs to basically do faster than real-time processing. Um, the last thing you want is to need 24 hours to go through surveillance footage to get an answer 24 hours later from now, right? So using GPUs, we can process to basically come up with what happened in two, one or two hours. So here is something uh, Nick is working on. Uh, he just basically clicked on that person, and we're using things uh, of advanced correlation filters, something that both me and Professor Kumar worked on uh, to track the person. And it's, it's constantly adaptive. 
what you're seeing here is the points per function of the filter, and it's changing. Uh, here's some more examples of it using to actually track something like a helicopter. Now as a consequence, you can actually get a very nice stable view of what you're seeing there. We're not displaying that, we're displaying the point spread function, but you can actually see, you can see some of the features. You can see the person going in uh, and the car still there. It's a very stable view, so you can do a lot of things. And as we're, we're looking to things with mini UAVs also. And some high speed car chases. Now, we're processing this at about almost 300 frames per second on a normal GTX NVIDIA 480 card. Uh, so we're not even using more than one card, we're not even using you know, a series of CUDA cards. So as you do that, you can process even faster, right? The only dis bottleneck here is displaying the information. Uh, if you just said, okay, track this card, let me know where it is or in this frame, you can do it offline, you don't need to display, then you'll be processing even faster, right? Uh, I'll show this last, last video. Uh, this, of course, is not in GPU, this is in MATLAB. Here we're look, working on the filters themselves. When it's red, it's basically tracking the person, but it's not updating the filter because it's saying, I'm getting a match, but it's not good enough to update because I made drift. So, that's the person. Now, he's going to go out of frame. He's going to come back in again, and it will actually pick him up. I was actually quite amazed when he did that, by the way, so... And, and it is actually the same person, if you're thinking that, too. It, that was actually the same person. So with that, I'd like to thank our sponsors, of course, Carnegie Mellon Scilab, Bima, Raytheon, IARPA, ODNI, and uh, DOJ. And of course, we're looking at industry partners for those remotely viewing this. Uh, a lot of the work we're doing here can be leveraged, so we really would like to see explore possibilities of you becoming a Scilab partner and uh, talking about how you can uh, fund some of this work through the different membership levels and leverage some of the work we're doing for the government. Thank you. Thank you, Maria.